All right, Matthew 21, there are two parables here towards the end of Matthew 21. Uh, Both are related to one another. Just a couple of notes that this is, uh, these parables are given in Jesus' final week before his crucifixion. Uh, He's already entered Jerusalem uh, triumphantly to die. So death is on his mind. He knows what's coming. Both parables that he teaches here at the end of chapter 21 are both aimed at the leaders of the Jews, his enemies. Uh, They tend to be kind of harsh, as we'll see. So verses 28 to 31 Uh, The first half of 31, this is the first of the parables. Uh, But what do you think? A man had two sons, and he came to the first, and he said, Son, go work today in my vineyard. He answered and said, I will not, but afterwards he regretted it and went. Then he came to the second and likewise, and said likewise, and he answered and said, I go, sir, but he did not go. Which of the two did the will of his father? All right. Uh, Jesus' ongoing feud with the leaders of the Jews, the Pharisees and Sadducees, chief priests. Uh, A lot of it had to do with their resentment of who Jesus hung with. And he surrounded himself with tax collectors and prostitutes, uh, the most undesirable elements of society. Uh, And he regularly hung around him. Uh, And it didn't seem fitting for a man who was thought to be a, a teacher, a rabbi, a holy person, to surround himself with the off-scouring of society. And the Pharisees and Sadducees judged him based on that, and also jealousy, the fact that people seemed to like Jesus and he was making them look bad. And he was also challenging them regularly in their false beliefs about how one gets to heaven. So uh, on every front, they hated Jesus. So Jesus here kind of compares them to this crowd they despise so much uh, in verse 28 uh, and 29. The first son says he won't go and work, but afterwards he regrets it and then goes. Uh, On the handout here, a little word about that word regret. Uh, The first son represents repentance. When Jesus says he regretted what he said, first, first he refuses Uh, And this kind of represents the tax collectors and the prostitutes that the Pharisees hated so much. Uh, At first, they're disobedient to God, uh, against better knowledge. Uh, So the first son first says, no, he's not going to listen to the father, he's not going to do what the father wants, but afterwards he regrets it. Uh, uh, Metalamaya, meta. Metamelalamai, there we go, Uh, to have regrets, to wish something could be undone, to be very sorry, to change one's mind. Uh, Very similar in meaning to the Greek word for repentance, uh, metanoeo, which means to turn, to go in the opposite direction, to change one's mind, to feel remorse. So this regret the son feels is in fact repentance. He turns, he changes. It's more than a, a negative feeling, his regret. It moves action, opposite action. Uh, So as the handout also says, repentance is always more than just feeling bad about one's sins. And there are a couple of passages here worth examining. Uh, In the Old Testament, Ezekiel 33, 10 to 11. Ezekiel 33, 10 to 11. Uh, Therefore, you, O son of man, say to the house of Israel, thus you say, if our transgressions and our sins lie upon us and we pine away in them, how can we then live? Say to them, as I live, says the Lord God, I have no pleasure in the death of the wicked, but that the wicked turn from his way and live. Turn, turn from your evil ways, for why should you die, O house of Israel? So again, the point is this turning business. Repentance represents a turning, a turning away. It's more than a sorrow. It certainly starts with sorrow, regret, but it moves past that. Uh, It's an understanding of 
the fact that grace is renewal and you don't have to continue on in the same. 2 Corinthians 7, 8 to 11. 2 Corinthians 7, 8 to 11. For even if I made you sorry with my letter, I do not regret it, though I did regret it. For I perceive that the same epistle made you sorry, though only for a while. Here again, he's, Paul confronts the Corinthians with their sin. They feel bad about it. Paul says he didn't really want to make them feel bad, but ultimately he did because it's for their good. Verse 9, Now I rejoice that you were made sorrow, sorry and that your sorrow led to repentance. For you were made sorry in a godly manner that you might suffer loss from us in nothing. For godly sorrow produces repentance, leading to salvation, not to be regretted, but the sorrow of the world produces death. So again, the, the stark contrast between mere feeling of sorrow and actually a repentant kind of sorrow, which leads to a divesting of one's sin, to, to, to an, a reception of grace. I mean, sitting around feel, feeling bad about your sins doesn't help anyone. Uh, but putting them on Christ and walking away from them, this is what godly sorrow means. Okay, so the sorrow of the younger son is this sorrow. It's repentant sorrow. Uh, another point to bring out about repentance in Luke 3.8. You know, well, everybody feels sorry when they do something they shouldn't do or when they realize something about themselves that they don't want to realize. Uh, everybody feels bad about that, but that's, that's, not, that's not where we should stop. And we gain nothing by feeling bad. We can't make up for anything the worse we feel. So this repentance involves a, a, a recognition of the fact that God hasn't left us there, that he's restored us. So fruits of repentance, uh, what follows here in Luke 3, 8, uh, and these fruits are kind of the next step beyond this, this, the sorrow. Therefore, bear fruits worthy of repentance. Uh, and do not begin to say to yourselves, we have Abraham as our father, for I say to you that God's able to raise up children for Abraham from these stones. This is John preaching to the, uh, particularly the, the Pharisees and Sadducees that came out to him. Um, but he talks about bearing fruits worthy of repentance, and this is the next step beyond the sorrow. This is a, this is a life that embraces grace, that receives it and lives in it joyfully. Let's go with the past. So the second, the first son represents this, true godly sorrow, the Pharisees and the tax collectors who had done horrible things, but who ultimately repented and then says they went and did the Father's will afterwards. They produced the fruits of repentance. Second son, verse 30. He came to the second and said, likewise, he answered and said, I will go, sir, but did not go. So the second son represents those who appear to be faithfully outward, the Pharisees and the Sadducees in particular. Uh, they fail to live out their confession, though. So example, the religious leaders of the Jews who taught the law as the path to God's love. They looked and sounded religious and obedient to God, yet they did not live out the faith they taught, nor were they repentant, because one, they didn't believe their sins were as severe as others, and two, because they thought moral near perfection was adequate to gain eternal life. They had the law, they thought that was religion. It wasn't. So there was no need for them to repent, because they already figured they were living according to the law. So they represent the particular sin of those who belong to churches. Good, church-going people can both secretly and openly look down their noses at others for being worse sinners and imagine their lives are good because they belong to church. So this, this is a parable not just directed at the Pharisees and Sadducees, but one we need to take notice of too. Because it's easy for us to be that second son, to sit there in church you know, and say all the right things, but then when it comes to actual real life, to jettison it all and do our own thing, completely ignore the grace we supposedly have received and live like the rest of the world around us. All right, any thoughts, any other observations here about these first few verses? 
All right, next bit. 31b and following. They said to him, the first, Jesus said to them, Assuredly, I say to you that tax collectors and harlots enter the kingdom of God before you. For John came to you in the way of righteousness, and you did not believe him. But tax collectors and harlots believed him. And when you saw it, you did not afterwards relent and believe him. So there it is. Jesus makes it plain. He, which he doesn't always do. But here, now, end of his life, he's not pulling any more punches. He lays the story out there, and to make sure they get the connection, he just hits them between the eyes with it. Tax collectors and harlots are entering the kingdom of God before you. you know, imagine how that's going to hit them. They're the holy ones in Israel, the religious leaders, the pious. And Jesus playing flat out says, look, <laughs> whores and IRS agents are going to heaven before you people are. That would have made them a little mad. Uh, and he mentions John the Baptist, too. Uh, this, this confrontation was not just a confrontation between them and Jesus. It started with John the Baptist, actually. Uh, Matthew 3, 7 to 9, speaks to that. Uh, and when he saw many of the Pharisees and Sadducees coming to his baptism, this is John the Baptist, he said to them, brood of vipers who warned you to flee from the wrath to come. Therefore, bear fruits worthy of repentance. See, the issue with them was repentance. And John the Baptist calls them out on it. Bear fruits worthy of repentance. Do not think to say to yourselves, we have Abraham as our father. That was their hope of eternal life. They were Jews. They were born into the children of Israel. It was a given. So don't even think to say that. For I say to you, God can raise up children to Abraham from these stones. So it's a long history of unrepentance. And John did preach the message of repentance, turning to God, turning away from sin, receiving grace, moving on. Pharisees rejected that. Yeah, not surprising they didn't like him. Calls him a pile of snakes, a brood of vipers. All right, parable number two. First of all, any, any uh, other comments about parable number one? Well, first of all, the, the last question, last of all, I should say, uh, if they really didn't believe it, what John was preaching, why in the world would they come out to John to be baptized? Because evidently they did. They came out, it says there in Matthew 3, to be baptized, and John calls them out on it. If they don't believe it, why be baptized? Because they were still trying to earn their way. That was the right thing to do. Yeah, I'm not sure they understood that at the time, that it was a right thing to do. I think it was a popular thing to do. It was a, a way to endear themselves with the people. Uh, everybody loved John the Baptist, so they were going to feign loving John the Baptist by letting themselves be baptized by him, when in reality they were rejecting everything he was saying. It was playing popular opinion, their own egos. So complete lack of genuine repentance. Parable 2, verse 33. I hear another parable. There was a certain landowner who planted a vineyard and set a hedge around it, dug a wine press in it, and built a tower, and he leased it to vine dressers and went into a far country. Uh, notice how many of Jesus' parables that we have been through involve some rich landowner who goes away. Uh, he's not there. What does this represent? It's the rich landowner who goes away and is absent. <laughs> Obviously, you know, God, God the Father, the way God works. God is not present physically. Uh, outside of Jesus himself, of course. But God the Father seems absent. He's given us all the things we need, and then we don't see him. So, you know, we can do what we want, we may think. And people do think. So this is a representation of, the, of, a, of God the Father not being right there present and apparently being absent. 
So that's in all of these parables, there's this element of an absent greater force, which stands for God himself. Uh, he set a hedge, which was a protecting sort of thing, which is the origins, I guess, of multiflora rose. Did you know that? Miserable things. They were originally brought to this country as hedges to keep fences, to keep cattle in, I think. And then they got away. Not a, not a good idea. So anyway, he sets a multiflora rose hedge around his, around his vineyard to keep the grapes safe because nothing can get through that stuff. He digs a wine press preparing for a harvest, anticipating a harvest. Builds a tower again for purposes of protection of his vineyard as a lookout. He leases it, that is, he makes provision for the ongoing care of his vineyard. You know, everything that needs doing for this thing he has done to protect it and to give it the best possible chance to be fruitful and grow. Uh, the vineyard has always been an image for Israel, and the Pharisees and the Sadducees knew it. They knew these texts. Uh, and it's an important text about the nature of God and what he does for his people. So Jesus is drawing on a very old image, an image they would have known to confront them with their own sin. So Isaiah 3, take a peek there. And I, Isaiah was a well-read and well-known scripture to the Jews. They would have known this text. So when Jesus talks about a vineyard, they know exactly and immediately what he's talking about. That is Israel itself. So Isaiah 3.14, the Lord will enter into judgment. Uh, yeah, yeah, okay, that's the right one. Enter into judgment with the elders of his people and his princes, for you have eaten up the vineyard. The plunder of the poor is in your houses. Okay, eaten up the vineyard. And he's talking to the elders of his people and his princes. So the failure of the vineyard here is being placed on the elders of the people and the, the political leaders, the princes. Now stay in Isaiah chapter 5, verses 1 to 7. Now let me sing to my well-beloved a song of my beloved regarding his vineyard. My well-beloved has a vineyard on a very fruitful hill. He dug it up and cleared out its stones. He planted it with the choicest vine. He built a tower in its midst. He also made a wine press in it. So he expected it to bring forth good grapes, but it brought forth wild grapes. Uh, before I read more, note the parallel between what Jesus says. He virtually quotes this verbatim when he describes the vineyard. So they would have known exactly what he was referencing. Verse 3, And now, O inhabitants of Jerusalem and men of Judah, judge please between me and my vineyard. What more could have been done uh, to my vineyard that I have not done in it? Why then, when I expected it to bring forth good grapes, did it bring forth wild grapes? And now please, let me tell you what I will do to my vineyard. I will take away its hedge, and it shall be burned. I will break down its wall, and it shall be trampled down. I will lay waste, lay it waste, and it shall not be pruned or dug, but there shall come up briars and thorns. I will also command the clouds that they rain no rain on it, for the vineyard of the Lord of hosts is the house of Israel, and the men of Judah are his pleasant plant. He looked for justice, but behold, oppression. For righteousness, but behold, a cry for help. Now, whose fault is the failure of the vineyard here? It's not as obvious as the first citation in Isaiah. Why has the vineyard failed? He looked for domestic grapes. He gets wild ones. So whose fault is that? That's, that is. It's on the people. It's the vine itself doesn't do what the vine was supposed to do. It's the vine's fault. The grapes themselves are not producing what they, what they were planted to produce. So it's not so much being laid on the, on the political leadership of Israel. Failure here is seeing, seemingly being laid directly on Israel itself, on the men of Judah and on the people of the house of Israel. So far, it's not being laid at the feet of the religious leaders, which is where I'm going with this. 
in all the Old Testament references of the vine, when it talks about the failure of the vineyard, it's being placed on either political leaders or on the people themselves. So you can see how the Pharisees and the Sadducees as religious leaders would have kind of thought to themselves, none of this is their fault when things go bad. It was an ego trip for them. They weren't the cause of any problems. They were the one good part in the whole vineyard. The rest of it was going to pot because of its own issues. Uh, finally, Jeremiah 12, 10. Jeremiah 12, 10. Many rulers have destroyed my vineyard. They have trodden my portion underfoot. They have made my pleasant portion a desolate wilderness. All right, obviously then the rulers, again, the political leaders, are being blamed for the failure of the vineyard, which is God's people. Psalm 80. This is a common Old Testament image. Psalm 80, 8 through 16. You have brought a vine out of Egypt. You have cast out nations and planted it. You prepared room for it and caused it to take deep root. And it filled the land. The hills were covered with its shadow and mighty cedars with its boughs. She sent out her boughs to the sea and her branches to the river. Why have you broken down her hedges so that all who pass by the way pluck her fruit? The boar out of the woods uproots it and the wild beast of the field devours it. Return, we beseech you, O God of hosts. Look down from heaven and see and visit this vine and the vineyard which your right hand has planted, and the branch that you have made strong for yourself. It's burned with fire. It's cut down. They perish at the rebuke of your countenance. Uh, and then it goes on there. Uh, the failure of the vine and the vineyard here isn't specifically defined as being political leaders, necessarily, or the people. It's just sort of God did all this great thing, and now the whole thing is... You know, the, the, wild, the boars are uprooting it. The wild beasts of the field are devouring it. Almost makes it sound in that verse like it's outside forces, outside Israel that's ruining it. It's not the people, not the leaders. It's the bad nations around it doing it. It's everybody but the religious leaders. So you see how common an image this was. In fact, uh, I, I've read that in the... In the Old Testament temple, uh, that there was a gateway into the temple with a golden vine around it, the first temple, that supposedly had clusters of grapes in the gold that were the size of a, of a man. So a huge vine with huge grape clusters in solid gold uh, that you had to walk through to get into the temple. As a, it was a symbol of Israel itself. They were the vine, and nobody got to go into the temple except the children of Israel. So it was, it was sacred ground. They were the holy vine. And this is, this is so essential to the very identity of Israel itself. So Jesus here now chooses an image in Matthew that everybody would have known what he's talking about, of common image, and whereas all the other images place the failure of that vineyard on the people or the politics, Jesus pins it to the religious leaders, uh, which, you know, is really going to make them mad. So the vine dressers, verse 34 to 36. Now when vintage time drew near, he sent his servants to the vine dressers that he might receive its fruit. And the vine dressers took his servants, beat one, killed one, and stoned another. Again, he sent other servants, more than the first, and they did likewise to them. So who are the vine dressers? The Pharisees and the Sadducees. It's the religious leaders. The people charged with keeping the vine uh, and, 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 and keeping it in production. Uh, it hearkens to what it says elsewhere in the New Testament with, let not many of you become teachers because we will receive the harsher judgment. Well, they, they were proud of being teachers and did not take that judgment seriously. And they killed the vine. Any comments or thoughts before we move on? All right. The ones they kill, 
It says he sent servants. This is a reference to the prophets, uh, particularly even John the Baptist is included in this. Uh, two citations. Let's just at least look at the first from Acts 50, or 7, 51 to 53. Acts 7, 51 to 53. You stiff-necked and uncircumcised in heart and ears, you always resist the Holy Spirit as your fathers did. So do you. Which of the prophets did your fathers not persecute? And they killed those who foretold the coming of the just one, of whom you now have become the betrayers and murderers. So over and over again, this is brought up to them that Israel, and that particularly the religious leaders, are guilty of killing God's prophets, persecuting them, those are the servants God sent to the, to the vineyard. Verse 37. Then last of all, he sent his son to them, saying they will respect my son. Is this a bright move by this king? I mean, if you were a father, you just sent your servants, they got killed and beaten up, would you send your son into that? Hey, you, go check him out. You pick your least favorite son, send him into it. <laughs> you know, what father wouldn't have seen this coming? Th that's another thing about Jesus' parables, where we've got this rich landowner slash father slash king. He always does something that seems incredibly dumb in a way. Uh, something that's careless, that makes no sense, that's completely against all human logic. You know, as an example with just a few of the parables we've looked at. Uh, the parable of the sower and the seed. The landowner throwing his seeds every which way. Nobody does that with seed. It's too expensive. You don't just throw it in the middle of the road. You're careful where you plant it. Not this guy. He's throwing it every which way. In the middle of thorns on paths, in the middle of a road, it's going every which way. Not, not good practice. Uh, the prodigal son's father. You got this snot-nosed little kid who comes up and says, hey, Dad, I wish you were dead. Give me the inheritance. He says, okay. You know, what father would do that? No father. You put him in his place and tell him, don't talk to your father like that. Um, the king of the unforgiving servant, one of the parables we recently had, uh, who has this unimaginable debt, you know, 10,000 talents, uh, I think we said uh, the equivalent of 60,000 years of, of work to work that off. Uh, and the guy just forgives it. Who does that? Nobody. Uh, the king in the parable of the shrewd servant. That is, he fires a guy for misusing his books. The guy goes out, settles accounts in a way that costs the master tons of money just to make himself look good because he knows he's about to be fired. King calls the guy in and says, Nicely done, you know, well played. You just totally wrecked me, but uh, hey, you know, you set yourself up real nice. You know, who does that? Nobody does that. In all of these parables, it's the king or the landowner who does something that's ridiculously foolish. Why? What's the point? Certainly, Jesus isn't trying to in some way defame God and make God look bad or say God's a, a doddering old man who doesn't know any better. What's his point? Why does the king always seem to mess things up? You know, last week's, the landowner hires servants from the beginning of the day to, to the 11th hour, one hour left in the workday goes out and finds a bunch of deadbeats standing on a corner and hires them and then pays them as much as the guy who's been working all day long. Who does that? Nobody does that. So why does this guy do it? I think we should ask him, you know, what God does for us, that he continues to forgive us, even as a prophet, he can be... It, it is grace. It is the illogic, Ill human logic of God's grace. It makes no logical sense from human terms. God does what we wouldn't do. But in doing what we wouldn't do, 
We're saved through that. You know, and this, this is Jesus' point every single time. Grace isn't what we think it is. It isn't what we expect it to be. It's not according to human logic. It defies human logic. It's a generosity that looks careless from our point of view. Uh, it, is, it is not a generosity based on work and reward. It's just a gift he wants to give us. And here, sending his son, knowing by all outward signs, surely the son's going to be killed. Well, you know, that is what God did. Sent his son knowing full well he was going to die. What father does that? No one in their right mind but a God who loves us enough to let his son die for us. Uh, but a God of grace who's looking for a way to reconcile our lives with him. So it is absolutely a way to show how radical grace is from a human point of view. All right. Verse 38. But when the vine dressers saw the son, they said among themselves, This is the heir, come let us kill him and seize his inheritance. All right, so as exactly we would expect to happen, happens, and for that matter, as exactly as God knew would happen, happens. You could take this back even as far as creation itself. If God is all knowing, Surely he would have known before he even created Adam and Eve the whole mess that would follow. The sin, the death, the corruption, the inhumanity of man to man, the evil. Had to have known all that was going to happen and he still made Adam and Eve. Why would he do it? So that he could love us and show us, him, show us his grace. So that he could rescue us. You know, God is love. What he does is always motivated by love even when it defies all human logic. So here, sends his son exactly what would expect to happen. Happens, but it happens because the landowner is a God of love. Now, uh, how about the logic of the vine dressers? This is a guy who owns a vineyard. This is no small thing. He's got money. When he got money, he got power. When he got power, you've got people with broken noses who can go and beat other people up and, you know, get your will and your power enforced on them. It makes no logical sense either from these vine dressers to think that by killing the son, the inheritance is going to be theirs to claim. They're not, they're not stopping this guy from his money and power. And any idiot would know if you hurt a rich man's son, there's a price to pay for that. So what they do also defies logic but against themselves. The king's defying of logic is always for the good of others. But the, the vine dressers defying logic is to their own detriment. They had to have known he was going to not take this. You know, there's a, there's a story, this is, this is a, a bit off the track here, um, but the idea of you know, doing something to a powerful man and not thinking there's a price to be paid for that. Uh, there's a story of John Gotti, you know, the mafia boss. His neighbor, this is a true story, his neighbor accidentally hit, I think it was a grandson of his, and killed him. It hit him in a car, kid ran out in the car, hit him, killed him. John Gotti kidnapped the guy and cut him in half with a chainsaw. Alive. Now, there's... When you, when you hurt a ruthless man's family, there's a bloody price to be paid. And human logic tells you that. Uh, these guys act against all human logic. They had to have known there'd be a price to be paid. They didn't care. It's exactly the story of the Pharisees and the Sadducees. They turned on God, they killed his son, and they don't think there's a price to be paid for that? 39. So they took him, cast him out of the vineyard, and killed him. Of course, they thought they were doing the Jews a favor by killing Jesus because they considered Jesus to be a false teacher. But nonetheless, they killed the king's son. Therefore, when the owner of the vineyard comes, what will he do to those vine dressers? Uh, they said to him, he will destroy those wicked men miserably and lease their vineyard to, another vi to other vine dressers who will render to him the fruits in their seasons. 
So the, the, the leaders of the Jews understand the logic and what Jesus is driving at. They're not connecting it to themselves yet, mind you. They're still totally oblivious to the fact he's talking about them. But they understand the principles involved and what should logically happen to them. Now, 42. Jesus said, have you never read the scriptures? The stone which the builders rejected has become the chief cornerstone. This was the Lord's doing, and is it not marvelous in our eyes? Or, and it is marvelous in our eyes. Uh, Jesus quotes verbatim from Psalm 118. Uh, it was a scripture the Jewish leaders would have known well, and which they would have understood as referring to the Messiah. The Messiah is the cornerstone. The cornerstone is the linchpin of a building. He is the thing everything is built on. You take the cornerstone away, the building collapses. So the Messiah is what Psalm 18, 118 was talking about, is the cornerstone of Israel. And it's usually a big, unwieldy stone that won't ever move. And if it falls on you, it'll crush you. Because it ain't like the other bricks in the building. So Jesus is applying this to himself. He is the cornerstone that, Isaiah, that uh, Psalm 118 was talking about. And again, the, the leaders he's talking to knew what he was saying. They get it. He's saying he's the Messiah. And now he makes the application even clearer. 43, therefore I say to you, the kingdom of God will be taken from you and given to a nation bearing the fruits of it. Now, he's, now he makes a connection. They're the vine dressers. They're the ones who killed the son. They're the ones that the king is going to come down on like a ton of bricks. 44, and whoever falls on this stone will be broken, but on whomever it falls, it will grind him to powder. It certainly sounds like a strong judgment against them for their horrible conduct as vine dressers. For the, I mean, essentially, essentially, these vine dressers have introduced a different religion in Israel under the name of true religion. Their religion is a religion of law. They never claimed to worship a false god. It was still the same god, but it was a, a path to that god through the law, an impossible path. They had no gospel, no concept of gospel, of forgiveness, of reconciliation. Uh, it was all through law instead of through the sacrifice of the Messiah. Verse 45, Now when the chief priests and Pharisees heard his parables, they perceived he was speaking of them. Ooh, you know, they finally hear now they get it after Jesus just plain spells it out for them. But verse 41, they didn't get it. They're always putting this on other people. They never make application to self until Jesus makes it for them. All right. How are we doing on time? Yeah, just, just a, a couple thoughts yet. So they get Jesus' point. Now notice, notice something Jesus does. He publicly calls them out in front of everybody. He humiliates them in public. This is the week he's going to be crucified. So I think this humiliation he's heaping on them in public will ultimately add to, to their uh, fervor for getting him executed as quickly as possible. He's embarrassing them publicly now. He's not just teaching against what they teach privately. Um, Jesus also embarrasses them publicly and calls them out in front of everybody without first privately going to them and talking to them about their sin. In Matthew 18, when it tells us how to resolve conflicts, it says if our brother sins against us, go and talk to him first privately. Jesus doesn't do that here with them. And every time we have a, every time we have a synodical conflict or controversy, it seems the erring side always screams bloody murder. Well, you should have come and talked to us privately and not just called us out publicly. Recently, the St. Louis Seminary published an article um, that basically made deistic evolution acceptable. Uh, an article that said, 
uh, that, that allowed for the idea that a day in creation was really an eon, you know, a huge period of time so that you can accommodate evolution into the biblical model. And a whole bunch of people scream bloody murder that this was false doctrine, including two districts. Uh, I think the Wyoming district might have been one. Um, can't remember the other one. What was the other one, Dan? South Wisconsin. I think it was South Wisconsin. Two districts publicly chastised the seminary for having taught false doctrine. The seminary's response was, well, if you had a problem with this, you should have come and talked to us privately. Which is a completely wrong application of Matthew 18. When the Pharisees and Sadducees were sinning publicly, openly, Jesus confronted them publicly and openly. When the sin is public, the reproof should also be public because lots of people have been brought into it. So these districts were completely right biblically, and the seminary was completely wrong biblically, but they tried to hide behind this, well, you should have come and talked to us privately nonsense. Not when the sin is public. So Jesus, Jesus has no obligation to talk to them privately about their sin. Uh, their sin was very public. It needed to be addressed for the sake of the people who had been affected by it needed to be addressed publicly. Last point. Verse 46. But when they sought to lay hands on him, they feared the multitudes because they took him for a prophet. What cowards. If they were genuinely convinced he was a false teacher, which they were, then that should be all that matters. All their concern should be was eliminating false teaching so it didn't infect God's people. But they're not looking at it that way. They're thinking of their own skins. They didn't want to lay hands on him and have him arrested because they feared the people. Everybody loved Jesus. They didn't want to get unloved. So they play along. They're just cowards. All right, what common thread connects the two parables? The first parable was about what? Repentance versus unrepentance. The second parable is about the same thing, really. Uh, Jesus is highlighting the unrepentance of these vine dressers, how their unrepentance led them to total rejection of God's Son, you know, contrary to what the king wanted. So both lessons deal with unrepentance and the consequences of unrepentance. Uh, the first more explicitly showed the consequences of repentance, which was you know, ultimately being in the good graces of the Father. It's about all we have time for. Thoughts, questions, comments. So the bottom line is, that God wants to be and is, in fact, a gracious God, wants to be forgiving even of the, the worst sins, uh, but ultimately, uh, when unrepentance persists and people insist on their right of rejecting God, ultimately, you know, God is a God who, who judges unrepentance. So the second parable, we see the ultimate consequences of unrepentance. All right, let's close with prayer. Merciful Father, we do thank you for having brought us your Son, for having brought us into your grace, forgiven our sins, and having likewise brought us to repentance. And we pray that you would keep us repentant throughout our lives, protect us from the worldly spirit that wants to reject you, and strengthen us in true faith for Jesus' sake, in whose name we pray, amen.